could you pull up Matthew 5, 6 for me? Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you blessed? Are you really blessed? Well, let's, I want to, I want to define blessed. Would you read that? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? A lot of people aren't hungry. They're not thirsty. Very first prophecy I ever received, 1982, when I was born again. I didn't even know what prophecy was, and I went to church, and there was a prayer meeting. I thought, well, I want to be a part of that. Didn't have any idea what kind of prayer meeting it would be and I walked in and at that time I was so hungry I was so thirsty I mean I literally would wake up panting for God in the morning and go to sleep meditating on him in the evening that was a lot of years ago and this lady named Chloe pulls me over and she said what's your name young man and I said Dave and she began to prophesy over me She said, Dave, the word of the Lord for you is, blessed are you, young man, because you hunger and you thirst for righteousness. And young man, the Spirit of God would say to you, you will be filled. You will be filled. And we've been getting filled all week. It's been like nine days of glory around here. If you haven't gotten filled, it's just because you got too much leaking. Everybody say, vessels leak. We got to keep them filled up. Life can leak. You got to stay full. So this morning, let's hook up with uh, Prophet Kevin as he comes. And he's going to impart today. Man, last night, if you weren't here, you you missed a great opportunity to get close. He brought a message on getting close. We had a visitation in this room last night that was extraordinary. But you know what? It's a brand new day. It's a brand new day, and we're about to have a brand new visitation today. Just say, Jesus, I'm so hungry. I'm so thirsty. I'm so thirsty for the living God. As a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome Prophet Kevin as he comes today. Amen. Amen. Well, when he had these camp meetings and these special meetings at the Rock, uh, we designed them to be intensive to fill you up for a long time. Uh, my name is Kevin Little. I've been a part of this church ever since its inception, and in, uh, one of my best churches as far as relationships, and Dave's one of my best friends in the ministry, so we're excited about what God is doing. How many are ready for hearing a word from the Lord this this morning? Amen. We got a a young man I want to introduce to you. Come on up here, Josh. Now, Now, do you live in this city, Josh? Where do you live at? Connecticut. Kind of got your GPS got you lost. How'd you get down here, brother? I was having some issues back at home, and uh, I was actually going to go and see a therapist, and my mom called, and she's like, you know, she found out everything that was going on. She's like, uh, you know, why don't you come down here for a week, just kind of hang out. And, okay, you know. where's your mom at? Is your mom here? Just stand up and wave your hand, mom, so we'll see who you are. Amen. Glory to God. So how, how old are you, Josh? 20. You're 20, and uh, you've had quite a week, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what happened to you? We just tell what happened to you and how you feel. Just kind of stand up straight. They're not your enemies. Just kind of look at them eyeball to eyeball. Here, hold them. <laughs> I got saved on Monday. I 
I'm telling you, man, it was like a feeling I never felt before in my entire life. And what happened last night? Oh. <laughs> Got to experience that same feeling again. Did you start praying in tongues? Absolutely. So how many are glad that young people like this are getting transformed? I, I, I want you to know there is a knowledge above college. And it's the knowledge of the spirit. Well, let's give Josh a big hug. And when you get him out there, give him a hug. And when he gets out there, just said, We're, you're going to make it, son. Father, we thank you right now that the call to be a minister and a businessman is upon Josh. He is not going to miss it, and you're going to give him dreams and vision in the days to come. And God calls his children and his grandchildren to walk in the path of life in Jesus' name. Well, let's give the Lord a mighty hand of applause. Amen. Are we recording back there? Okay. Well, I'm going to start with a humorous story since it's Sunday morning. I very seldom do this, but it's Sunday morning, so let me start with this. Get on my Joel Osteen anointing here. Hallelujah. <laughs> After the christening of his baby brother in church, Jason sobbed all the way home in the backseat of the car. His father asked him three times, what's wrong? Finally, the boy replied, that preacher said he wanted us brought up in a Christian home, and I told him I wanted to stay with you guys. <laughs> As you read the Bible, you see Jesus revealed, but he doesn't just reveal himself with one dimension or one face. In the book of Ephesians especially, he is revealed as having five different natures. The apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. And they're not just names, they're natures. The apostolic nature to be sent and go beyond. The prophetic nature to bring you into communion with God and remove all obstacles. The teaching or educational nature to explain to you what God has done in your life. The most boring thing you can be around in a teacher is for him to try to explain something that never happened to you. Teachers are always to come after the experience. You need the explanation after the experience. And of course, then we have the pastoral nature, which is the caretaker, the lover. And then we have the last one is the evangelist, which is the Christ who will leave the 99 and go after the lost sheep. Well, tonight I represent the face of the prophet. Turn in your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. My job is to bring you closer to the Father, to remove all idols and obstacles to bring you close to God. And anybody who wants to keep their idols really doesn't like to be around me. And if you are loving your obstacles, you don't want to be around me. But if you want to be free, I am your friend and your liberator. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul is addressing the Roman church, and he says these words, I beseech you, therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Everybody say, reasonable service. Reasonable service. You know, based on the condition of your relationship with Christ and where you want to live with him, when you hear a message, it's either unreasonable or reasonable, especially if you are around a responsibility preacher. Now, Pastor Dave and myself, we are responsibility preachers. We're not just going to preach something. We want to hold you responsible to that. We want to hold you responsible for what you heard. And we want to set up an accountability system that if you say, I will do this, we want to hold you accountable because that's what good fathers in the natural and the spiritual do. And he says, this is going to be your reasonable service. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When he says, don't hold on to the world system, there are two major words for the word world. The first one is the word cosmos, 
which means the orderly arrangement of a world system and the people that live in it. It would be like the operating system for a computer that operates everything in the computer, then your software. Well, Satan has an operating system for this world, and the Lord has an operating system for this world. His is called the kingdom of God. And so what God is doing is when he gets a new person saved in the things of God, he starts replacing your operating system. Now you're born in a moment. The birth in the spirit takes an instant. But the renewing of the mind, the renewing of your mind, your will, your emotions, your conscience can sometimes take several years depending on how much you invest in it and how much you pursue it. And he said that don't be transformed by being around the world. The word there is not cosmos, it's the word aeon. And it would be similar to pop culture. Don't let pop culture or culture that's going to fade away determine how you live your life. Don't be connected by I've got to have this, I've got to have that. This is the coming thing right now. He says replace it with the kingdom of God. And whenever we have these kind of situations where you encounter pop culture, there's always going to be conflict. Always. And so today we want to have a two-part aspect of this message. The first one is to let you understand what it takes to enter into the second part. And so when you don't understand what God is doing, you're kind of hesitant. Anytime you ask somebody a direct question and they have hesitation, it's because they have low revelation. Or they haven't made a decision. And so the Spirit of God is here today to bring you to a new place in Him by giving you understanding. Now, the main focus and assignment upon all churches, but this church in particular, is apostolic. The concept of apostolic comes from the Greek-Roman mindset. Jesus actually borrowed the word apostle from the Roman and Greek military system. The apostle was what we would call a general or an admiral of a fleet of ships or an army of men going to a foreign country to colonize it. And he told the 12 disciples, that now you guys are going to be my apostles. You're going to represent my army. You're going to represent my kingdom. And so the apostolic anointing or the apostolic heart always wants to colonize. The pastoral heart always wants to harmonize and get everybody that's broken pulled in but because of the call of the pastor in this church it is extremely apostolic the moment that something gets to be a routine the moment something gets to a maintenance level where there's no more fighting and warfare your pastor gets bored and he wants to expand again that is how God designed him that is how he was designed by God well the apostolic calling need something that cannot be created in a moment. They need disciples. And the majority of churches on Sunday morning don't have disciples. They have just believers. Well, I believe God. They never witness. They never fight. They never have conquest. They never cast out a devil, never prophesy. But they're nice people. Everybody say, nice people. Nice people. Say it again. But that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive and walk in the purposes of God. And so in order for you to be an apostle, you got to have disciples. you got to have warriors. you got to have workers. And Jesus said, don't pray for the harvest. Pray for workers. And then equip those workers so they can flow and move in the things of God. If you do not confront and contradict the culture that is in America, it will capture the Christians that are around you. And so when you're making disciples, you have to be conscious all the time, confront the culture, confront the value system, confront, confront, confront. And we've got tons of Christians in our churches who are confused in their value systems. They celebrate things that God says, these are abominations. You get many Christians, they don't understand uh, why, why we don't accept homosexuality as a viable lifestyle. Well, they love each other. Well, what's going to be next? Your Great Dane? I love my Great Dane in the same way. No, you, you got to have a draw. I draw lines where God draws lines. I said, I draw lines where God draws a line. 
I agree with him. That's why I'm a Christian. If you don't agree with him, you may not be a Christian. So I have to confront popular culture, its values, its mores, its concepts about how to live your life and your conclusions. And so when you understand what we're confronting, it makes it more simple and direct to create disciples. You know, I have said for years that the prophets of the pop culture are the comedians. There is something prophetic about comedians because they can see a situation and they can find the irony in it. And the moment that a popular culture comedian with bad morals and bad values starts making fun of something, he can demonize something that is good and make you think, I don't want to be a part of that, or you do that. And so when you make disciples, you have to crush that. Now I want you to imagine for just a few minutes that the Rock Church right here is the only expression of Christianity for 100 miles from this location. How the people in this 100 mile sphere will interpret what Christianity is for the next three generations will depend upon how you live and how you present the gospel of the kingdom. Your lifestyle, your family life, your values, your morals, your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, your witness, your demonstration of the power of God will determine the decisions and the directions of who becomes a Christian and what they'll be in the next three generations. You see, if you were the only church in this county, could God use you and could he depend on you? If there was no other options. And the reason I say this is because in your own Bible is a testimony of when the church went from apostolic to pastoral and they were captured by pop culture. When you read in your Bible, turn to the book of Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians, most of those books were from the Asia Minor area, southern Turkey, Mesopotamia, all around there. They were bastions. They were forceful places of apostolic church planting. But if you go to those places now, they're Muslim or they're neutral. It's against the law in Corinth that area right there to preach the gospel on the street. It's against the law. How did they lose such ground? How did they go from the place where you wrote scriptures about and apostolic teams to the place now where there's nothing? It comes by good people who do nothing, who do nothing to witness to their situation, who do nothing to change the things that are in this area. And I said, Lord, what is stopping this church from exploding. And I'm going to tell you something. When God tells you something, when the Holy Spirit talks to you, it is so simple many times, you just pass it. And here's what he said. There is a lack of desire for the end result. There is a lack of desire for the end result. Well, I go to church on Sunday morning, three fast, three slow, preach, get the money, and away we go. Get my go to heaven card punch, say hi to my friends, and I'm done for seven days. That is not Christianity. That is not how he designed it. That's believerism. That's not disciples. And Pastor Dave has been commenting several times this week. He said, man, I'm just tired. And this guy's got a, 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 a tremendous work ethic as far as going to the gym and exercising. He said, man, I'm just tired. This morning at 3.40, the Spirit of God visited my bedroom, and he says he's tired because he's been fighting principalities for his people. He says he's been wrestling all month because anytime you start a new venture and the devil knows about it, he's going to send demonic opposition to come on your people, come on your staff, come on the people that are around you to try to fuss and fight with you, to distract you from becoming the thing that God wants you to be. Now, I preach... 60% to 70% of my time in the last four or five years in third world countries. And I'll preach the same message, the same anointing to different people, and the results are totally different. And I was, as the Lord reminded me of this, he brought this scripture, Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus said the same thing. 
Because many times we want something different than what we're getting because we think if I got something different, I get a better result or a different result. Matthew 12, 41 and 42. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with the generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came out from the end of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. What God is saying is that if I would preach the same gospel to third world people, they would be blowing it up, surrendering, committing, serving, giving. But what happens is we get dull of hearing. And you get dull of hearing by not doing the gospel. I said you get dull of hearing by not doing the gospel. And when you hear the word, you begin to attach criticism and all your bad stories. And I got hurt over here. And what if this is wrong? And all the evolution teachers from your college days and high school days start attacking you. And maybe this is not right. And so you don't hear the word of God with pure ears. You're contaminated. And the problem is that when you are living your life, you cannot be an overcomer or successful without hearing the voice of God. You can't just hear principles. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Now, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is giving us specific instructions about how to be a disciple. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, reading down to verse 39. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I am come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he that chooses to lose his life for my sake will find it. Now when we hear these words spoken, the problem is if you try to interpret what you just heard me say about enemies in your household, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law fighting, you cannot context that, contextualize that. You cannot contextualize that in a Western mindset. Now, if you've ever been to Africa or the Middle East, if you've ever been around Muslims or Jewish families, when you become a Christian and want to live for Jesus, the Muslims, the honor killings, they will kill you. I mean, if you were a Muslim woman and you were in this church, they would kill you. If you were a Jew, they would turn their back on you and said, my son is dead. My daughter is dead. And so what Jesus is saying that if you're going to choose me, you've got to choose me as more valuable than any other relationship. That's what he's basically saying. Amen. He's not saying don't be nice to your family. Don't become a cult. What he's saying is that I choose you as my highest relationship irregardless of what anybody else says to me. Whether my family, my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. And most people that make an initial call to God and come to God, it's usually a family member or a close friend that leads you from discipleship. Now the devil may be working through them. I advise all you young people when you get born again and when you get spirit filled, go through your cell phone and anybody that would be a, a, a detriment or a temptation for you, delete them or put a call block on your phone because the devil will move on people to seduce you from your purposes. And until you make up your mind, this is my highest relationship, there is none other, I'm not going to let anybody else deter me. I'm going to pick up my cross and I'm going to follow Jesus. And the problem in this church today is that we got too many half committed Christians. You're trying to live his life and save your life at the same time. You cannot do both. You cannot do both. 
And I'm not talking about being legalistic. I'm talking about being single-minded, single-visioned. There are some things you cannot do once you become a Christian. He said, if you confess me before men, you know what that really means? It means to live the gospel openly. It, when somebody challenges you about what you believe, you challenge them back. You challenge them back. If they say, man, let's go get some beer. He says, no, you don't say, no, I'm not thirsty. No, you say, I've chosen not to drink. I've chosen not to inhabit in that behavior. Why? Because I'm a born-again Christian, and that's not going to be a good witness for me. I choose not to smoke marijuana. I choose not to play that game. It didn't say, well, I'm busy tonight. That's not what he said. He says, confess my purposes, confess my morals, confess my values before men. And when you do that, I will confess you before the Father. It means to live openly. It means to live opposite of the way you were living before you got born again. It means to live with persecution. Many Christians, the first couple of months they get saved, they're on fire. They're kind of raw. Everybody say, kind of raw. raw. But because they want to be accepted back with friends or what if this Christian thing didn't work out, they become sophisticated sinners. They don't really raise their hands full force. Hallelujah. And you can see they go from on fire, hand gets lower, 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 voice gets lower, 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 manifestation gets lower, 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 zeal gets lower, lower, pretty soon. Hallelujah. God bless you. I love you. You go from on fire prophetic ministry to Barney prophecy. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family. You're not going to conquer nothing with that Barney attitude. And the Spirit of God is saying, you've got to make a decision if you're going to be a part of what I'm doing in this church. There's hundreds of churches, hundreds, that you can be in sin, you can be compromised, and no one will ever ask you a question, no one will ever confront you. But the book of Proverbs says, woe to the child who raises himself, who has no parents speaking into their life. To deny means to contradict, to disavow, to disregard, to reject. And the Spirit of God is here today saying, I am choosing to do something brand new through you. Amen. That was a good place to shout and scream if you didn't believe it. I'm choosing to do something brand new through you. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Whenever you are building a church, creating a ministry, dealing with family, choosing a mate, some of you single people, this is the test that you should give them. This is the test. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That pearl is Jesus and the kingdom. In other words, this is so valuable, there's nothing in my life that even compares to it. Doesn't even compare to it. It's a treasure to me. I'm going to do everything I can to maintain it, to provide for it. But if you don't see Christ as the pearl of great price, all the things in your Christian life are going to be relative. It's going to be, what am I going to get? What's in it for me? Do I have to go there? Do I got to be a part of this? Because you've never seen Jesus as the pearl of great price. And foundational to Christian living. It's to see the pearl. And I would ask many of you, you pray the prayer at the altar of Jesus, come in my life, and then, 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 then. But that's not enough if you're going to be a disciple. You've got to see the pearl. Somebody shout, I want to see the pearl. I want to see the pearl. Come on, let your voice bubble up. I want to see the pearl. I want to see the pearl. Come on, let us scream. Come out of you. I want to see the pearl. I want to see the pearl. Because all of you have many, many pearls. Your job is a pearl. Recreation is a pearl, sports is a pearl. And we don't want to take any of those things away from you. But when God says, hey, now is the time I need you. I need you now. You surrender easily because you recognize this is the greatest thing I could ever do with my life. Now, whenever you hear the word house, family, city, temple, 
church in the Bible, they're all the similar concept of community. They're all very similar in community. That's his way of communicating. Revelation 21, 21. I want you to understand why the pearl of great price revelation is so absolutely critical for you to become what God wants you to be. Because he wants you to create a house, a family, a church, a temple, a city. Revelation 21, 21. The 12 gates of the city of God were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Now, this is symbolism. There are real pearls. But what does it symbolize? How do you make a pearl? Your irritation in life, in a pearl, turns when they begin to coat that irritation and it turns into something precious and luminous as a pearl. Streets of gold refer to character. So he's saying, listen, if you want to be a doorway to your house, if you want to be a doorway to a family, if you want to be a doorway to a ministry, you've got to become a pearl. You cannot let every irritation make you have an animal nature. I've got to be a pearl. I've got to let everything in my life be coated with this luminous material of Christ himself. He is the pearl of great price, and he's going to make another pearl. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Now, can I tell you that pastor teachers and teacher pastors in the church will not fulfill this scripture very often because their main motivation is love and education. A pastor thinks I can love them into it. They just don't know when to let go of some folks. Other people said, if I just keep talking, they're going to get it. But look what he says. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before the swines. They will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And here's what he's basically saying. The people that have not chosen to make Jesus the great pearl, at some point in your journey, they're going to trample on you. Because vision is progressive. And if you keep walking with pastor, he's going to ask for more and more and more, more cross, more sacrifice, more service. Not because it's him demanding it, it's because Christ himself is demanding it of you. You cannot go from glory to glory to glory without more sacrifice. Everybody shout, the church is built on sacrifice. The church is built on sacrifice. Say it again. The church is built on sacrifice. And so when God begins to take us to another level, he has to use different kind of language. The scripture says that my word is like a sword. Sometimes you're in a Christ meeting and the sword of the spirit separates you from something. His word is like a hammer. You could be in some message, I feel like I'm just getting beat all over the place. He's knocking this, he's knocking this into shape. Then other times that his word is like a fire. I just feel like everything in my life is being consumed. Well, those are things that God must do to prepare you for your next level and the life that he has for you. It is a nature that he's releasing upon you. Now, the gospel of the kingdom of God in this generation has been romanticized. You know, I used to be a Roman Catholic. I never could understand how Mary went from a little Palestinian girl about four foot nine, probably my complexion, to a six foot blue eyed supermodel in Europe. That's the romanization of the gospel. That's been romanticized. That's been romanticized. The gospel has been institutionalized. It's been politicized, formalized, intellectualized, and marginalized. And we've had this great attack against the gospel. And when you become an apostolic leader, you want to restore this thing. You want to cause it to change. We went from families to franchises. We've gone from demonstration of the gospel to just doctrines. We've gone from apostles to apostasy. We've gone from an army to an audience. We've gone down from prophecy to principles from martyrs to merchandisers, from parents to politicians, from empowerment to entitlement, from pioneers to posers, from, from prayers to poems. You go to most prayer meetings, it's just a bunch of poems. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you in Jesus' name. No power, no faith. 
from transformation to just having information. We've gone from community to disunity. And the reason is very simple. And many of you in this room today, the Spirit of God is going to come and ask you some questions and investigate you. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. When the Lord went in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve had fallen and they're hiding in the bushes, the King James Version reports that God said, Adam, where are you? But that's not the correct interpretation. Here's the correct interpretation. He said, Adam, how did you get here? How did you get here? I left you in the garden. How did you get here? You see, whenever you get around men of God, women of God, fathers of God, they don't just want to give you comfort. They want to find out how did you get here? How did you get in this mess? How did you get so confused? Why? Because if I don't diffuse it, you're going to be there again after the restoration. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Now he that received the seed among the thorns is he that hears the word, that word there is logos, and the cares of the world, the word there is aeon, the cares of pop culture, the cares of pop culture, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The word cares means distraction, anxiety, to divide me, to cut me to pieces. Now, God doesn't want you to be in a monastery and all you do is go to church. But on the other side, he wants you to be devoted to the kingdom exclusively. And God will give you time for vacations and your family. He will give you time for recreation. But when that becomes your idol, when it takes preeminence to the pearl, that's when God rises up and said, it's choking out the seed inside of you. You see, every one of you has a gift and a calling. Every one of you has a divine assignment that one day you'll be judged for what you did with that gift and that talent. And the talent that God put inside of you, if the cares of the world are choking your talent, he says, cut it off. Modify it. Let something change in there. The word deceitfulness of riches means to be deluded. You know, I know people that have worked double jobs to buy a shirt or a pair of shoes that ends up in a garage sale five years later. And it's still on their credit card. They're still paying for it. It's worth nothing. It's a pop culture icon. And you've got to understand that if God is calling you to service, you can't just live your life like the rest of the people in the earth. You've been called to be a disciple. You've been called something special. You've been called to impact a generation. The word choke means to suffocate, to drown, or to strangle. Now, there are two entities that God himself initiated and ordained. Number one is the family, and number two is the local church. And if you want to understand how to walk with God, how to serve God, you must understand his emphasis on maintaining and creating family. And you must understand his emphasis on maintaining and creating local church. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. About 30-some years ago, this revelation first appeared to me. And when I got born again, I was a gifted person. I witnessed at 10 people a day for six years when I was living in Europe on an Air Force base. Miracles, signs, wonders, prophecy, angelic visitations, going to heaven, visiting hell, so on and so forth, I was very gifted. And I could have had a popular career in Christendom talking about my past, creating the prophetic flow. I mean, I had a, a secure future because I had a gift. But God interacted me. He touched me. He said, son, what is the gift for? And when you get around people who have not seen a gift, they get impressed, they're dazzled by it. They go like, wow, that, how did you know that stuff? And I was caught up in my gift because I was a young Christian. I mean, I prophesied that people said, man, how did you know that? I went like, in my head, I went, I don't know how I knew that, but I act real confident. Well, you know, I'm called to the Lord, you know. <laughs> but I was discovering this gift inside of me. But after about seven years of doing that gift thing, God visited me and said, now, son, I gave you the gift for a reason. You've been chasing your gift. Let's find out what it's called for. 
This is one of the key verses that shifted me. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, reading down to verse 4. This is a messianic uh, scripture. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the hills or mountains and shall be established above the hills in all nations. The word nation is the word ethos. It means people groups. Ethnos is people groups. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks or agricultural implements. Nations or ethnos shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, you'll see that scripture put on many prominent buildings as a sign of the coming millennium, like that's going to happen. Can I tell you that that's God's plan right now? We're the church, we're the city on the hill. When I saw this, something changed inside of me. Verse 2, he said, on the top of the mountains, the highest pinnacle, now, this is symbolic language from the way God speaks. On the highest pinnacle, the highest mountain, or the highest achievement, that's where he's putting the Lord's house. You know why? Because the house in God's mind is the hub of all of life. The local church and family are on the highest mountain. Everything else is minor. Everything else is less than. And when I saw that, God said to me, he said, son, when you spend the best of your life and the rest of your life to build families and to build the house of God on that high mountain. He said, there's a lot of things you could do with your gift and your time, but to me, that's the highest thing that a man could ever do, is build families and build houses. And when you understand how God thinks, everything changes. And one of the things that I've found as I've traveled these 40 years is that whenever I find gifted people, they are the most difficult people to pastor and to lead. The deeper their gift, the greater their gift, the more difficult they are to lead. The more talent and innovation they have, the more difficult they are to put on a team. They got the prima donna attitude, the I'm better than you attitude. I I can do this and you can't do this. All this friction Frickin' frack. You see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm of this. I'm of that. But when I understood this scripture, it is the harmonizer of gifted people. It is the harmonizer of prominent people. If you have money today in this place, the best thing you can do with your money is to put it in the local church with a good leader. Why? Because that's what God is doing. You know, so often I'm asked, Kevin, what is God doing in the world? What is, you're a prophet. You travel. What is God doing You know what? He's building local churches. You're looking for something spectacular, but God said, this has always been my plan. This is my plan, building solid local churches with solid families. And that's how I'm going to affect the earth. We want some kind of symbolic revival with some gifted guy. And when it's over, it's over. And people are disenchanted. We make some gifted guy the guru or the head guy. But that is not what God is building. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Now, the word judgment in the Hebrew means return to balance. It really means measurement to return to balance. And so I know a lot of people here have been hurt by church, hurt by relationships, hurt by your daddy, by your mama, by all kind of situations you've passed. And you're afraid to go step into your future. How do you step in the future if you've been hurt? How do you step in the future if you come from a bad church life? How do you step in the future if you had abusive and abrasive leaders? This is how. You measure your way back to health. You measure your way back to normal. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment or measurement to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first... What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, God says the hub of my kingdom is the house. Natural houses where you live, where your families develop, and local church families where they become 
a harmonizer. And for anybody who doesn't have a natural father, natural mother, natural grandparents, never been mentored, this is the place for this thing to happen. And he says, measurement begins at the house. Let me give an example. The first miracle that Jesus did was at a wedding. Why? Now, there's a principle in Scripture called the law of first mention. Wherever something happens first is significant in God's typology and his plan. Jesus gave, gave the first miracle that happened in his ministry at a wedding. It happened in a wedding. Why? Because the thing that God is starting with is the thing he's going to end with. We're going to end with the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's beginning with the end. It's the architectural design. Guys, this is what I'm building. Use your anointing for this. Use your gift for this. Use your energy for this. I'm building family. I'm building church. And then he takes these six water pots. This symbolizes man. The number six always symbolizes man because man was made on the sixth day. The water pots were clay that had turned into stone because they'd been fired. He fills them with water, and the water turns to wine. Why? Because God says your teaching and your revelation will stay water until you live in the context of community. Living in community turns my water into wine. Everybody's a marriage expert until they get married. Everybody's an expert on child education until they get a child. Your water or your teaching or your theory turns to wine, which is life in the context of relationships. And you know, the problem is we've got a Jesus in theology that is not a real Jesus. How many could imagine Jesus dancing at that Jewish wedding? How many could imagine him smiling and laughing with a glass of wine spinning around? Hey, God, you're legal now, dude. Get it on, get it on. No more condemnation. You're dialed in, brother. Well, that's how everybody acts at weddings, isn't it? Why would Jesus say, I, am, I bless your wedding. You're blessed by the Messiah. No. It's a fun event. Jesus started his ministry at a party. He started his ministry at a celebration of life. Because that's what God is after. That was a paradigm of what your ministry is for. Now, whenever you read literature or whenever you watch a movie, there's always a plot and a subplot. Everybody say plot. And subplot. And so when you look at some kind of theater or you look at a show or you read a book, you have to decide as an author, what's the plot going to be? You have your main characters or your main premise of the book, but then you have other subplot characters and situations that they're not critical to the plot, but they add to the plot. They support the plot. And so that's the same way it is with the Lord. It's like how many have seen the movie Shrek? You saw the movie Shrek. What is the plot of Shrek? Distempered ogre meets princess. And he only meets her in the daytime, but really she's an ogre by nighttime. And so he falls in love and that's the plot. That's the plot. But there were other creatures in that movie that were subplot. Let me ask you a question. Was the donkey plot or subplot? subplot? How about the cartoon characters in the forest, plot or subplot? subplot. How about the dragon, plot or subplot? subplot? How about the midget king, plot or subplot? subplot? Now, what would happen if they emphasized the subplot more than a plot? What happens to the story? It's confusing and messed up. Doesn't make any sense. Well, God has a story called the kingdom of God now watch what is prophecy plot or subplot I'm getting confusing voices here what is prophecy plot or subplot subplot what is worship plot or subplot what is family plot or subplot 
No, family's plot. Because God says, you call me father because the father wants a family. Making sons and daughters plot or subplot. That's plot. Generational thinking, plot or subplot. So you understand that many times in the church, we got people that are gifted for the subplot, but they want to make the plot their gift. I have a deliverance ministry, and I will do the deliverance thing. Hey, that's subplot, bro. We only got you here to cast out the devil so that you don't mess up the plot. Oh, I got a healing anointing, shababa, shababa. Plot or subplot? No, we got to get you healed so that when you get in a relationship, you don't drive people crazy. Do you understand that it produces subplot and plot? And so if you don't understand that I was born for the plot, that my subplot must support the plot, else I destroy the plot. And some of you, you ought to rewrite your business card, subplot ministries. (laughs) Used to be plot ministries. And so the thing is that because your subplot is so exciting and so bombastic and so dramatic, you think, I must be as important as the plot because the demons come out screaming. I must be as important as the plot because people get healed and jump off of crutches. Well, Jesus designed that you be subplot. And you can be a part of the plot if you understand how to take your gift and surrender it to the plot. You know, years ago, I would go to a church like this, and I could probably prophesy to 50 or 60 of you right now this morning. And here's how my services went 30 years ago. I'd be preaching along, and I'd see healing or this or prophecy, and I'd I'd stop my own message and say, sir, can I pray for you? They start crying. Demons come out. I walk over. I have a word for you. I'd hijack my own service. I I would destroy my own service because I wasn't hitting the plot. And the Lord says, son, I said, once you start flowing in the manifestations, nobody wants to hear about the plot. Nobody wants to hear teaching. All they want is that prophetic candy. He says, I want you to change how you do your meetings. Tell them about what I want to do, how I want to do it, and the last part of your time with them, then pass out the prophetic candy, then give the words of my wife. Because it's the plot that's the most important. The most important thing I could ever do is make you a better father, make you a better mother, make you a better son, make you a better daughter, make you a better elder, make you a better deacon. The best thing I can do is show you the plot. And the moment you find your gift, your gift is like a 100-pound woman walking a 100-pound dog. Sometimes the dog's walking the woman. Sometimes the woman's walking. I just, just got a hold of me. And once you have a gift, you have a desire to manifest that gift. And the more spectacular that it is, the more people want the gift and they don't want the plot. But the Lord said, I have an eternal purpose. And whenever you hear the word house, temple, family, city, you know you're getting close to the plot. And God expects everything, everything to connect with his plot. And if you've got a ministry and you've got an anointing, and you've got some kind of revelation, and you disconnect from the main plot, which is family and local church, yes, yes, yes. Come on. you're undermining the plot. Come on. You're trying to steal his show. And the Lord says, I'm about to do something unusual with gifted ministers in this church. And I'm going to visit them and I'm going to give them an understanding of how to support the plot. The greatest pain anyone can ever feel, ever, ever feel, is not physical pain, but it's the pain of being alone. The father said to Adam, it is not good that you be alone. 
He wasn't talking about marriage. He was talking about creating family and legacy. Well, how do you know it wasn't about marriage? Because in the book of Proverbs, it says, if your wife nags, you go on the roof. Nya, 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 nya. Get, be, go be alone, brother, till she gets over this storm, till the storm has passed. He wasn't talking about marriage. He was talking about creating family. That's why he started his ministry at a wedding. It was the plot. The miracle was about the plot. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 says this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper equal to who he is. Loneliness is the greatest pain on this earth. The most suicides in the Western culture, especially America, are between Thanksgiving, just before Thanksgiving, and New Year's. Why? What do you see on the TV? Happy families, relationships, gift giving. You see the plot. You begin to see the plot on television. It's a wonderful life. The Christmas story. You see people giving presents. A, even a Charlie Brown Christmas has some plot in it. And so they see the plot and they realize I am so far from the plot. I'll never be in the plot. <sighs> I'll kill myself. And suicide is a permanent solution for a temporary problem. You could come and join this church and be a part of the plot. Let me give you some of the forms of loneliness. Misunderstanding. You're tolerated, not celebrated. You live in unforgiveness. No family, no fathers, no memory of a corporate history, no understanding of your identity, not finding your tribe. You are dying of loneliness. Yes. And it's not just alone. You're just out of the plot. You understand that no matter how awesome this worship is up here, you can't join it. No matter how awesome you cast the devil out, you can't join it. Only thing you can join in the church is leadership, vision, and people. They come for the worship, but they stay for the relationships. They come for the miracle, but they stay for the relationships. They may come for the prophecy, but they stay for the relationships. They may come for the healing and the miracle, but they stay for the relationship. Why? God designed you to be a part of the plot. After you healed, I need a relationship. That's why God places so much emphasis on forgiveness and mercy and love and care. Why? That's the only way you can maintain the plot. Gossip destroys the plot. Communion restores the plot. The very center of God's plot is communion. The last thing that Jesus did was have communion. Here's what communion is. Communion is when you reach into your heart and you take something private, something personal and significant, and I feed it to another person. And then they take something out of their heart, private, personal, and significant, and they feed it to me. Communion. Everybody here wants communion. You want to meet your guy, your friend, your tribe, and when you see him, hey, let's go hang out. I don't want to talk about surface things like the weather. I want to talk about heart things. That is the center of the plot. That's the center of what God designed you for. And that's why God hates religion and politics and strife. Do you know what the opposite of communion is? Gossip. Because gossip is personal, private, and significant. I mean, if it's going to be good gossip, it's got to be significant. If it's going to be good gossip, it's got to be private. Did you know? It is the exact opposite of communion, and that's why God hates gossip. And there's gossipers here, and you're going to find yourself against God because you're messing with his plot. You're separating from the plot. 
You're dividing from the plot. You're the subplot and you think you're so anointed, but you're destroying the plot and God will end up cutting you off. Now, it is so interesting how we in the Western world cherry pick scriptures. We get a scripture here. We get a scripture here. Put them all together and say, this is the word of God. No, this is the confusion of man. It's not the word of God. In the 1100s, they began to break the entire Bible, Old Testament, into chapters. In the 1500s, a printer, not a theologian, divided the chapters into verses for ease of reference and use. But the problem is I can come to the Bible and I can pick a verse here and a verse here and a verse here and I can create something that God is not emphasizing and you got to read it in context. Let me just show you one. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Very familiar portion of Scripture. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with the Scripture in context. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Nothing wrong with that scripture, but what's the context? The context is when Solomon was dedicating the house of God. He was dedicating the temple. And here's what he said. He says, when you disobey me and you get captured and you're in a foreign land, if you will stretch forth your hands towards Israel and the house here and say, Lord, forgive us, we sin, take us back home. Take us back home. Then it says, if my people will say that prayer, take me back home, I'll hear the land. We disconnect forgiveness from the house. We disconnect repentance from the house. And in this scripture, he said, wait a minute. It's not just about repenting. It's about the reason you got messed up in the beginning is because you did not have a house. You did not connect this thing. Matter of fact, when he prays, he says, Oh God, arise to your resting place. Arise to the place of your rest. Turn in your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Today in this room, God is saying, I want to build a house. I don't just want to talk about a house, I want to build a house. And every single one of you, no matter what your age, you've been wired to live in the house. And there's many of you, you're lonely, you're terrified, you're fearful. And the very thing that you're supposed to live in, you're afraid to become it. And here's the thing, you can't come to the rock and join the house, you got to come to the rock and die and become part of the house. It's like watching lovers across the restaurant. They're loving each other. They're happy. And here you are looking at your mate. You're mad. You're full of anger and bitterness. Because there's something that has to die for that relationship to be functional and be good. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, what is the greatest command of the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And here's what he's saying. Every scripture in the Bible comes down to these two verses. Why? Why does every scripture, every ministry come down to these two verses? Why? Because this holds the plot together. Relationships hold the plot together. Everybody say relationships, relationships. holds the plot together. Relationships holds the plot together. You know, our brother Mark has been here all week. And he's just been weeping and crying, and he called his family. He said, man, you guys got to come and visit us. You, you got to come and see this church. I've never been to a place like this for a long time. They celebrate me. You know what he stepped into? He didn't step into a ministry. He stepped into a house. Mark, as much as I love you and as gifted as you are, we didn't treat you any different than we would treat somebody who was 20 years old who just found out they had to give Why? 
It's not something we're doing. It's something that we are. You just stepped into the average life in this church. You just stepped into the decision why your pastor here understands the difference between plot and subplot. Yes, we like hot meetings. Yes, we like hot preaching. Yes, we like deliverance and miracles, but it's all subplot. Stop living in the subplot. You can be an awesome singer and have a horrible marriage. You can be an incredible deliverance minister but have a horrible marriage. Why? That subplot. And you can have no miracles and you can have no prophecy and be the most wonderful person in this church because you give your life to maintain the plot. You serve the plot. You serve the plot. You serve the plot. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That word there, love, is agape. Agape God. The second one is agape yourself. And then agape everybody else. The church turns it around. Agape God. Agape everybody else. And if there's anything left, agape yourself. Man, we ought to have as much revelation as they do on an airplane. When they do those safety briefings, the lady comes on and says, in the event that oxygen leaves the, leaves the air, aircraft, there's going to be oxygen mask drop down. Ignore your child for a few moments while you put the mask on yourself. Because if mama passes out, baby has no hope. Honey, you got to love yourself with agape love. You got to get over your past because you're not going to be any good to the plot because the plot operates by relationship love. And if you got daddy issues, mommy issues, past issues, past the issues, you will not be a part of the plot. You're going to be full of gossip, not communion. Somebody say, let's time to build the plot. Time to build the plot. This is God's eternal plan. And if you fail, he'll just find somebody else to do it. Now, I want you to see this because this is so critical to the next phase of this church. And everybody can enter in. Well, I've not been to Bible school. You can do this. I don't have a lot of revelation. You can do this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3, down to verse 9. Jesus quotes this from Deuteronomy. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe that it may be well with you, that you may be multiplied greatly as the Lord your God fathers has promised you and given you a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, Walk by the way when you sit down and when you rise up. You shall be binding them to your, as a sign to your hand. They shall be as front as on your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, you got to understand what he just got to saying. He said, the scripture I read in Jesus, the scripture I read in Matthew, where it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, that's revelation. But a revelation without application will leave you deep in frustration how do you make that scripture reality when you sit when you stand when you walk and when you lay down you live this thing you talk to your children the gospel is caught not taught we are trying to do in a classroom what can only be done in a living room relationships you join the church in a relationship, not in a worship service. Well, I really like their worship. I really like that guy's anointing. I like demons coming out. Yeah, but you can't live on that. Man, that Kevin had a good prophetic flow. You can't live on that. You can only live on relationships. And that's why many churches you go to in many areas, the pastor lives in his title, not in his nature. I am bishop, blah, 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 blah. You made your title your idol. Now, you need to respect the gifts that God gives you, but come on, we, we've taken this thing to superstar status. 
I got to have bodyguards in, bodyguards out. All right, you five bodyguards, walk with me. I'm your anointed leader. Brother, you only got 100 people in your church. Who are you protecting yourself from? I mean, if the adoring masses are ripping your clothes off, yeah, bodyguards, but you're Pee Wee Herman. Come on, doc. You don't need all five of those guys. And sometimes we have such this great desire to be relevant and to be current. I mean, years ago, I was at this little church. It wasn't no bigger than a cracker box. And the pulpit was right like this, and the pastor's office was were the end of the stage. It wasn't it wouldn't but 30 feet away. And they had armor bearers. Well, I got nothing against armor bearers. And they had those Radio Shack walkie-talkies. So he said, he said, are you ready to go, prophet? I says, yeah, I am. So we go to the door. I can see the pulpit from the door. It's a clear shot. It's a little back from here to the sound booth. I mean, it's nothing. And he gets on his walkie-talkie. Number one to number two. I can hear the guy without a walkie doggy. <laughs> number one, number two. I have the package. He called me a package. I have the package. Number two to number one, I see the package. I'm going, this is Pee Wee Playhouse right here. Come on, brother. I went from profit to package. I got the package. So the guy walks like 30 feet, picks me up, and walks me to the pulpit. He says, can I carry your book? I said, not really. It's only 30 feet, brother. I mean, if I get a flat, you can change my tire, but this is some easy stuff right here. <laughs> but it becomes religious theater because we don't know how to be normal. We don't know how to be relational. You ever see, I mean, there's some ethnic groups that when they meet, they're just so full of cliches. How you doing, saint? Blessed of the Lord and highly flavored. <laughs> how you doing, saint? The Lord is good all the time. God is good. Well, how come you're so broke? How come your marriage doesn't work out? That's just a cliche, brother. Be honest. Be real. Become a relationship person. You're dying of religious loneliness because you refuse to take off your armor and just be you and the family of God. And then we got all these crazy preacher types that want to have a religious show. They don't want to relate to normal people. You know, there's actually classes in seminaries that say as a leader, you cannot fraternize with your people. They won't respect you. You have to maintain an image of that you're higher than them. It's called the law of familiarity, the, the, the doctrine of familiarity. Well, that's not what Jesus did. Matter of fact, he starts undressing. Here's my wound right here. Here's where I got punctured right here. You got to understand that this thing has to be maintained as fathers and mothers. My job is to make a son. My job is to make a daughter who grows up to be a father and a mother who makes sons and daughters. And we will not have what God wants us to have until we adopt the revelation that we are here to build the plot. We're here to make this thing. Where I'm telling you, we got more spiritual orphanages and religious daycares in America. Yeah, you go to church, but there's no relationships. You ought to be the friendliest people in Parkersburg. It ought to be a sin for any visitor to come to this church and not be greeted by at least 15 or 20 people on a Sunday morning. If they're unfamiliar, give them a hug. If they're unfamiliar, shake their hand. If they're unfamiliar, say, hey, what's your name? But the reason you can't do that is because you don't agape yourself probably. You're afraid they may find out that you're not everything that your religious picture says you are. Everybody here has got issues. Some new, some old. Everybody here is going through the process of growing. And when you stop hiding, you can start living. And the Lord is saying, I'm here to establish my house. On the highest mountain. That's where he put his house. 
You say, Kevin, what's your dream to minister to multitudes and millions and millions? Well, if that happens, it'll be okay. Billy Graham spoke to more people face to face than any other preacher in the world, in human history. Millions. But of those millions, he only got less than 3% that got saved and stayed saved. Of the people that walked the aisles, only 3% that made that confession in stadiums around the world stayed saved. You know why? They were coming, come to Christ. You know what? Christ is the body. Not an imaginary concept that you sign a form and say, I accept that Jesus, I need a family. And the reason the recidivism rate was so high is because they answered a call for salvation, but they did not find a family. They stayed alone. They stayed empty. Today in this room, God is saying, will you join my plot? I know you're anointed. I know you cast out devils. You've been to all the pastors' training. You've been to Chris Jenkins' training. You've been to Cuppet's training. You've been to Kevin's meetings. But will you join the plot? Will you make this a place that's the highest mountain that the nations will come to? That you'll lay down your life for your brother. You'll lay down your life for your marriage. You'll lay down your life for your children. And that we understand we love hot services. But I want you to understand, sometimes more profound ministry takes place in the cafeteria of the church than the altar of a meeting. Because you get heart to heart, face to face. Because you get to take off that hiding robe. And I'm telling you, there are people here today, you're starving for relationships. You're absolutely starving for relationships. And you've gone to meeting to meeting and anointing to anointing and church to church. And I'm not against people being showbiz and having artificial hair and artificial faces. Get all the facelifts you want, but just be real under that facelift. I mean, if you go and ball, buy a wig. Buy the best wig you can have. Don't buy one of them synthetic plastic polyester wigs. Get a real hair wig. But under the wig, be real. Let the wig be fake and you be real. Why? That's the plot. That's the plot. I want you to bow your head right now. If I could get a keyboard player here. Man, I just feel the sweetness of God coming in this room today. Once I found the plot, my entire life changed. My ministry changed. My friends changed. Because I began to want to be around people that wanted to build the plot, not the subplot. And whenever I found people that made the subplot the plot, I became so agitated because I said, this guy's going to destroy God's dream. He's going to destroy God's vision. When I saw ministers that were bodyguard in, bodyguard out, they did not have close and clear relationship with the people that were on their staff and their team. Man, it just irritated me. It just irritated me. Because I knew that they were destroying the plot. I want you to bow your head this morning. And I want you to come before the Lord. And I want you to ask yourself a question. Are you plot or subplot? Are you plot or subplot? Are you building the plot or just having ministry? Are you building family or just having ministry? I know you travel around the world, but are you having ministry? Or having the plot? Now, these kind of meetings are to measure you. I used to prophesy 90% more than I do now. Why? Because I thought my prophecy was the plot. I prophesy more at a restaurant than I do in a meeting. Why? I get they really have a feedback conversation to pull them in the plot. 
If you've been living for the subplot, if you've been living for the subplot and not the plot, you're a great singer, you're a great minister, but you've been living for the subplot. I want you to make that adjustment inside of your heart this morning. Make that adjustment in your heart. And there's a lot of you, you're broken because you went from church to church and ministry to ministry. They had great preaching and teaching, but they didn't have the plot. You came from a family without a good plot. No father, no mother. Dictators instead of daddies. And now you come to the church with this incredible gift. You don't even know how to be a family because you never had one. You need to get into the plot. If you know you've missed this whole plot thing, just raise your hand. Just sit where you are. Just raise your hands. You know you've missed the plot. You've been living in the subplot. You've been ministering in the subplot. Come on, just raise. I, I see. Just put them up and put them down. You just missed the plot. Now, Father, be more than a title today. Just follow this church and be a father to us. Without Father, we can't have the plot. It was your idea. Without Father, we cannot have the plot because you maintain and hold together all that we are. You know, it's amazing when Jesus came to the earth, he did not come as a titled minister, he came as a son. When he was baptized at the Jordan, he didn't say, this is my beloved apostle, prophet, pastor. He said, this is my beloved son. Why? That's the main ingredient to build the plot, sons and daughters who become fathers and mothers. I want to be known as a father more than a prophet. I want to be known more as a son than anything else. Why? It's the plot. It's the plot. It's the plot. Can you sing something, Nikki? Is there something you can sing that you can think of? Just make sure her microphone's real hot. Nobody leaving. We'll be out of here in just a few moments. I feel the Holy Ghost shifting. I feel the Holy Ghost moving. A disaster is when two people who have never known the plot get married. When two subplot people marry, they just produce more mess, more subplot. They fight for stage time. Come awake in my heart for your kingdom's cause. Let it burn with a passion for the ones who are lost. Come awake in my heart. Come awake in my heart. Come awake in my heart for your kingdom's cause. Let it burn with a passion for the ones who are lost. Come awake in my heart. Come awake. 
come to life It's in your presence, Lord Blind eyes receive sight And in your presence, Lord You make me come alive Lord, you make me come alive In Jesus And in your presence, Lord you set the captive free and in your presence Lord and I find all I need it's in your presence Lord that you make me come alive Lord you make me come alive oh come awaken my heart for your kingdom's call let it burn with a passion for the ones who are lost. Come away, get my heart. Yeah. Come away, get my heart, Jesus. Oh, come away, get my heart for your kingdom's cause. Let it burn with a passion for the ones who are lost. Come away, in my heart. And come away, in my heart. Just stay there, lower the keyboard, and just you can be seated. I want to speak to failure. Just. Just stop the keyboard for just a second and come back. Hold on a second. I want to speak to failure for just one moment. Because when God decided to have this dream, he had a lot of failure. His first attempt was a failure. Didn't make him a bad daddy, but because God was dealing with free will creatures, Adam and Eve failed. They failed. They tried again with Noah, with his family, and he failed. Then God found a man named Abram and Sarai, and he started again. You see, that's the eternal plan. It will never stop re-germinating. And once again in Parkersburg, God is starting again with you. He said, I'm going to have this family thing and the dream thing, whether you want it or not. And of all the names that God could have been called in scriptures, El Shaddai, Jehovah Nisi, the bright morning star, the name that God loves the most is Father. Because Father wants a family. That's what he wants. That's his dream. That's the plot of eternity. That's the plot of eternity. Ministry gifts are just to support that plot. The fivefold ministers are just to facilitate that plot. Gifts and miracles and signs and wonders are just to support that plot. But the Father wants the family. And I can tell you what this kind of preaching does. If there's an orphan in you, you feel separated. If you don't have anything to connect to, you feel distant. If you came here to hear a message and maybe get a prophetic word or see a miracle... You feel like an outsider. Why? You're missing the presence. You're missing the moment. You're missing what God is saying. I want to have a family. That's why Jesus started at a wedding. God gave the signal. I haven't changed my mind about my plot. Come on, son. Let's do it again. And every time Jesus had a visitation where God spoke from heaven, he said the same thing. <laughs> this is my son. Why? You can't make a family with a gift. You can only make a family with a son and a daughter. <laughs> you can't make a family with deliverance. You can't make a family with miracles. You can only make a family with fathers and mothers and sons and daughters. This is the highest calling. That's why he said, on the highest mountain, I put my house. Hear me. 
When was the most angry Jesus ever got? When he made a whip and he went to the temple, he didn't say, you have made my ministry center full of false doctrine. He says, you have turned the father's house into a den of thieves. Why? Because if the house is broken, society is broken. If the family is broken, society is broken. And that's why the main requirement for leaders of the 14 things that are required of a bishop, only one talks about gift. 13 talk about character and how you raise your family. We need less gift and more family and we'd be more normal. Today God is saying, who wants to join my plot? Who wants to join my plot? And you're, gonna, you're not going to have perfect people to start with. That's why he said, you're going to be mentored by mercy. You're going to be molded by mercy. If you want to join the plot today, stand to your feet. If you want to join his story, his plot, stand to your feet. And he will begin to position you where you live, where you belong in that plot. Now, Father, I pray right now that every demonic spirit of loneliness, rejection, confusion, bad images of father and pastors, bad church, bad family, God, re-image us. Let us breathe again. Let us see again what can be and what will be as we go to the plot and say, God, work your plot in me. I don't want my legacy to be subplot that overshadowed the plot. I don't want my legacy to be that I did my ministry, but it was greater than the plot in where I was because I didn't see it. Just raise your hands and just say, Holy Spirit, put me in the plot. Put me in the plot. plot. Measure my ministry ministry. against the plot. plot. Measure my serving serving. against the plot. plot. Measure my attitude attitude. against the plot. plot. Measure my relationships relationships. against the plot. plot. I want to be in the plot. I want to be in the plot. I want to be in the plot. Well, give the Lord a mighty hand of applause as you sit down. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, you can do that for the Father. Come on. Let the Father know you want to be in the plot. Let the Father know you want to be in the plot. Lord, send your anointing. Send the presence of the Spirit. That's why when he dedicated both temples, Moses and Solomon, the cloud came on the house. We want the same kind of anointing to be on our ministry that comes on the house, but it will never happen. Because the greatest, highest calling is for the cloud to come on the house. We're going to receive a missions offering. I'm going to be going to Ecuador in just a few days. You can be seated. If you'll just play, sis. You should have an envelope in front of you. If you don't have an envelope, just raise your hands. We'll get you one. Now, everything that comes in these kind of offerings specifically goes to us so we can go to the nations. I'm at a time of my life where I want to go spend time with the nations and have things change and erupt. Thousands of ministers have never heard anything like this. They're living for the subplot. They're living for subplot. If you're making out a check, make it out to the rock. And if you get that envelope, just put plot on there. Just put plot or subplot. If you're a married couple, talk among yourselves about what you think. Hey, we ought to do this. We we could give this. There's something about giving to prophets that break open new territories that God says there's a special gift. There's a special grace when you do that. If you don't have an envelope, just raise your hands. I'll make sure you get one. Make out your check to The Rock. And they'll make sure they give us one missions offering. If you can sing that song again. 
Nikki. Come on, God is saying, come away and become part of my plot. And in your presence, Lord, dead hearts come to life. And in your presence, Lord, blind eyes receive sight. And in your presence, Lord, you make me come alive. Lord, you make me come alive. And in your presence, Lord, you set the captive free. And in your presence, Lord, and I find all I need. And in your presence, Lord, you make me come alive. Lord, you make me come alive. And come awake in my heart for your kingdom's cause. Let it burn with a passion for the ones who are lost. Come away in my heart yeah. and come awake in my heart Jesus and come awake in my heart for your kingdom's cause let it burn with a passion for the ones who are lost come awake in my heart and come awake in my heart all right you can receive their offerings if you would go ahead and how many just feel the presence of the holy spirit confirming and shifting things And what a privilege to be in this church with such great gifts. But if you get this revelation and you go to Columbus, that is a city full of orphans and gypsies. Columbus is a city full of orphans and gypsies. Because they're escaping religious plantations. The pastor was a Pharaoh, not a father. I know that every church is not bad there, but there's enough. There's enough. But we're going to have to heal them, guys. We're going to have to get them back into the groove where they can say, hey, you know, I can trust again. I can love again. Tonight at 630, we're going to be talking about the kind of leadership it takes. Seven o'clock. Tonight, we're going to have a very special meeting. It's for those that are the disciples who really want to be pushed into creating what we talked about tonight. There'll be no child care, but there will be his care. He's going to come and visit some folks here. Sunday morning, many times, for my kind of anointing, is a little bit uh, constraining. Because I really want to see people shaken and broken. Your name is? Come here, Samantha. What happened to you today during the preaching, when you, when you were hearing the preaching? Turn around. Um, just filled with his love. You just raise your hands. Samantha, you are about to encounter the plot. And the Lord says, I don't just want you to be a part on the outside. I want to make you a center of the plot. And I'm going to make you a mother, both in the natural and the spiritual at an early age. And you're going to begin to care for others, not because you have to, but because you want to. And the nature of the mother is going to spring forth and rise inside of you. Now it's like a waterfall of God's acceptance and God's love is flowing over you right now. It's flowing right now. I want you to write a song with Sammy and it's Samantha. Just sing to her about acceptance and her being a mother. Go ahead. It's called On the Spot Ministries. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, again. He's 
calling forth the woman of God in you he's calling forth the mother in you he longs to use you he longs to use you he's calling forth in you the mother that he longs for you to be he's calling it forth he's calling it forth he's calling it forth in you oh, homemaker he's calling forth the homemaker in you he's calling forth the homemaker in you don't take it lightly don't take it lightly he's calling forth the mother in you he's calling forth the mother in you there are people that need to feel your touch there are people that need to feel the need to feel the mothering touch in you he's calling it forth he's calling it forth oh. Now, Father, cause her to have such a visitation of your spirit in the next 90 days that she gets this on her own. And not only will she live it, that's it right there. He's coming over your whole body right now. Not only will you live it, you'll transfer it to others over and over and over and over and over. And you've got this, am I accepted thing. Do they want me? Do they need me? Where do I belong? When I count to three, I want everybody in this crowd to jump up, scream, shout. Here's why. This is how the Father feels about you, honey. One, two, three. Yeah. You can be seated. You're going to be gone here in two minutes. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you're backslidden, you're not where you need to be with God, you want to come back home to the house. You've never been born again, or you want to come back to God and be a part of the house, be a son and a daughter. If that's you, raise your hands. If that's you, come on. I want you to come up here, sir, in the white here. I want you. I want to. I want to pray for you. If you raise your hand, you said, I want to get saved or I want to come back home. Raise your hands. Just come up here right now. Just come up here right now. What's your name? Charles Harris. Is this your church, Charles? Yeah, I'm not a member here, sir. I'm fairly new here. So I want to come back home. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Charles. There's the glory of God coming on you right now. Do you pray in tongues, Charles? I've never prayed. Where's Nagel at? Come here, Nagel. Come on. There's the Spirit of God coming on you right now. Just relax. It's going to be like water going inside of a vessel. Helium in a balloon. Here it comes. One, two, three. It's coming over your whole body right now. That's it right there. Just take him out there and go get him spirit filled. Go with this guy. It'll be great. Come on. Hallelujah. Leah's 17. You're 17? Uh, I have no idea about her background, but I need about four or five women, women, not little girls, that said, I, I can mentor this girl. I, I can mother her. I, come on, just come. I need four, three or four of you to come. Come on. You be in charge. Okay. Go with her, honey. Go with her. She's in charge. How many glad you came today? Man, there, there's something hanging in the atmosphere. 
If you came from a broken family or a broken church, God is going to come and visit you and give you this revelation personally. If you want a personal visitation about this whole thing about plot, subplot, stand to your feet right now. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. Because this is the revelation that the church is built on. Son, you're not going to find it in a Bible school. You won't find the plot in a Bible school. Because you got to live it. Just say, Father, show me your plot. The plan of the ages. Show me your plot. Well, let's give the Lord a mighty hand as Pastor Dave comes. Hallelujah. Well, let's go and do show and tell. Amen. Let's not be hearers only, but let's be doers of the word. Hallelujah. Tonight we'll be back at 7 for anybody that's hungry or thirsty for more. Amen. We love you. We bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you. If not before, we'll see you tonight.